Won't you please stand with me for the scripture reading this morning? It's found in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Please be seated. Two. There we go. I did my part. You have to do your part. All right. Um, it's good to be here this uh, kind of wet day, but I guess Californians rejoice in the wet. Uh, having come from Texas, you can have all the water we have. Um, I discovered, too, in Texas that there's only one natural lake in Texas, and it was right by where we lived. Everything else is all a dammed lake area. But uh, I always, when I come by this way, I always have to take a look at the lake, Folsom Lake on the left, and careen my neck over and see if I'm seeing any islands sticking up. When I don't see any islands, it's like, hey, look, we got some water coming in. That's, I don't know how the water gets in there from all the different places, but I'm just thankful that I'm not seeing any islands with that. Let's bow our heads, shall we, as we pray. Loving Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you again. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to worship with you and the freedom that we have. We thank you for the blessings each and every day that you give us. The opportunity to be able to come here to a church, to be able to drive in, to have food, and to be able to also hear the word of God. I ask that you would touch my lips this morning, that they might speak your words, anoint them, and speak to each and every heart, is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. In the University of Chicago, on a particular day, it's known as Baptist Day, and then they invite some of the greatest minds to come and speak. This particular year, they invited a, a gentleman named Dr. Paul Tillich. And Dr. Paul Tillich was one of those very high scholars. He had read all these books that none of you and I had ever read before. And he spent two hours preaching. The only problem is, he was preaching to prove that the resurrection of Christ was false. Can you imagine what a waste of time for two hours? At the end of that, um, you know, people came to the auditorium. They asked if there were any questions. And from the very back of the auditorium, there was uh, an old man that stood up, a little old man. He had a crop of holy white hair. And he, he stood up and he pulled his apple out of his brown bag. And he, he said, Dr. Tillage, I, I got me one question for you. And he started chomping on this apple, this little Macintosh apple. And as he started chewing on the apple, he was talking the same time he was chewing, and the juices were running down his mouth. And he says, Doc, now, Dr. Tillich, I, I ain't never read the Bible and, and the, the way you read it in Greek. And he crunch, crunch, munch, munch. And then he said, now, I, I can't quote scripture. Crunch, crunch, munch, munch. And he says, now, I, I just have me one here question for you. Crunch, crunch, munch, munch. And he finally says, I, is this here apple? Is it sweet or bitter? Now all eyes turned to Dr. Tillage, and Dr. Tillage thought for a moment, and he said to him in exemplary scholarly form, he says, why, sir, how can I know if your apple is sweet or bitter, for I've never tasted your apple? 
All eyes now focus on the old man. And the old man stood there and he dropped the core of the apple into the bag and he rolled it up and he said, Neither have you tasted my Jesus. In Maranatha, page 212, Mrs. White writes here and she says, Our Heavenly Father claims not at our hands that which we cannot perform. He desires his people to labor earnestly to carry out his purpose for them. They are to pray for power, expect power, and receive power that they may grow up to the full stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. But then she has the following follow-up paragraph and she says, not all the members of the church are cultivating personal piety. Therefore, they do not understand their personal responsibility. They do not realize that it is their privilege and their duty to reach the high standard of Christian perfection. Are we looking forward to the latter rain, confidently hoping for a better day when the church shall be endued with power from on high and thus fitted for the work? She closes by saying the latter rain will never refresh and invigorate the indolent who do not use the powers that God has has given them. Are we using that power today? How many of you would say that you're living by faith? Can I see your hands? Well, let's, let's test that theory. We're going to go through a series of stories here. So I'd like you to grab your Bible with me and turn with me to Exodus chapter 14. <coughs> Exodus chapter 14. Now the children of Israel had just left Egypt. They're journeying together. They had the, the Passover lamb and everything was very quick and they're on their way and they reach a specific point now that they have the Egyptian army behind them. They have the Red Sea in front of them. They have the mountains on either side of them. The only thing that's separating the Egyptian army from invading them is the pillar of fire. Do you remember that? Verse 13 says, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Now, let's pause for a moment. You have to understand, these Egyptians... I mean, these, <laughs> these Israelite slash Egyptians, they were, they were not really Israelites. Over the past 400 years, their faith had been eroded and eroded to the point that they were eating just like the Egyptians. They were dressing very, if they could, like the Egyptians. They, their mindset was kind of like, they, they were worldly. Kind of like... Adventism today. They were forgetting the past. And God was bringing them out of Egypt not only so they could be remembered how God is, but also to change their diet, to prepare them to take them into the heavenly Canaan. They were unsure so much about God, and they, now with the Egyptian army coming right behind them, they were scared. What do we do? Everybody's kind of freaking out. And then finally, Moses says, don't be afraid. God says, stand still and watch what he's going to do for you. And then he goes on and finishes the verse. And he says, for the Egyptians you see today, you will see again no more. For how long? Forever. Now, notice the words. The Lord will what? He will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The Lord will fight for you. Many times we take up arms and we fight for ourselves. From the fourth volume of the testimony, page 26, Mrs. White says, the Hebrews were weary, they were terrified, and yet they, if they had held back when Moses bade them advance, remember they were at the Red Sea, go forward, if they had refused to move nearer to the Red Sea, God would have never opened the path for them. 
in marching down to the very waters, they showed that they had the faith in the word of God as spoken by Moses. They did all that was in their power to do. Then the mighty one of Israel performed his part and divided the waters to make a path for their feet. This is the key that I want you to remember. They did all that was in their power to do and let God do the rest. This is the what versus the how. What are we supposed to do? God says, stand still. Watch what I'm going to do. But how are you going to separate the waters? How are we going to get across? God's saying, you know what? That's not your problem. Your problem is to watch and wait and expect that God's going to give you power and he's going to deliver you. How? That's his problem. We're told God has a thousand ways of doing things of which we know what? Nothing. Do you think Moses had all this calculated out? I mean, according to the quartermaster general of the army, he did some calculations about this. Now, we know that roughly there were at least two to three million Israelites that were crossing through there. Do you think Moses thought for a minute, how are we going to feed all these people. I mean, that's a lot of people to feed. So in marching out to the wilderness, three million people would require 1,500 tons of food each day. Now, there's, there's no Taco Bell and Subway along the way. Where are they going to get their food? In the wilderness. Yeah, they might have brought some provision with them, but where are they going to get that food? Do you know that to bring 1,500 tons of food each day would be two freight trains a mile long. They would need firewood to cook the food too. That would be 4,000 tons of wood. That would be a few more freight trains a mile long just for one day. And how many days were they in the wilderness? 40 years, 40 times 365. That's a lot of time. Now, when you're in the wilderness and you're in the desert, where are you going to get water from? You, you don't go to the faucet and just turn it on. No, that required a lot of water. You're in a very hot, parched area. You know how much water that would require? That would be if they just drank and did a few dishes, forget about bathing, that would be 11 million gallons a day. That would be a freight train 1800 miles long just for one day now here's the other thing that we don't think about when God said go down to the Red Sea I think we've watched Charlton Heston too many times you know with a dum dum da dum and he stretches out his hands and there's the pathway and then they walk two by two through there you know if they walked two by two in orderly file down through the red sea you know how long it would take for them to get through 35 days and nights do you realize that the path the swath they had to go through had to have been wide enough that they could do it overnight in 8 hours 5,000 abreast, three miles wide. So all the pictures that we see with the water wall on this side and the water wall on this side, no, we're talking a mile and a half that way and a mile and a half that way. But that's what God's going to do. How? Not their problem. Not their problem at all. And just to imagine, every time they stop to camp, that would be a campground the size, two-thirds the size of the state of Rhode Island. Can you imagine that? And it was all orderly done. You see, in taking care of the children of Israel, they did all that was in their power to do, and God took care of the rest. Where was God leading them? Into Canaan. Think about us in the antitype. We are the same as the Israelites, except we're just modern Israelites, and God is trying to take us into the heavenly Canaan. And just like the Israelites of old, God required them to put 
explicit faith in Him. The same thing has to happen for us today. But we're not there. We think we're there. We raise our hand like we're there, but we're not there. Follow along. There's more. Turn with me to the story that we find in 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. This is the story of Elijah when he goes to Zarephath and meets the widow. 1 Kings 17, starting in verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a woman was, was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and says, Excuse me, please, would you bring me a, a little cup of water that I may drink? And as she was going, he calls out again and says, "Um, Can you also bring me a morsel of bread in your hand? So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little jar of oil. And see, look, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in, prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat and live forever. No, that we may eat and die. How morbid is that? I, I mean, can you imagine her thinking, look, we're, we're just, we just have a little bit of flour. We're going to eat it. We're going to eventually die. And who are you thinking that you want me to bake something for you and give it to you? But Elijah comforts her and says in verse 13, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterwards, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends the rain on the earth. And so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah and She and he and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. How? She could have said to Elijah, how in the world am I going to prepare for you this when I don't even have enough? Did she have faith? Absolutely. She could have said, forget about you. No, she did according to what Elijah had asked because she knew Elijah was a man of God. The what? She did. She prepared the cake. She prepared that little bit of bread and gave it to him first. She had a little bit left for herself and her son. How was it going to happen? Not her problem. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14 as we look at verse 13. This is the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew 14. In Matthew chapter 15, ironically, there's also another feeding. It's the feeding of the 4,000. Did you know that Jesus did a mass feeding of two different groups? And you wonder why two different groups? Here's the reason why. The feeding of the 5,000 were the children of Israel. They were the Jews. The feeding of the 4,000 were the Gentiles. Whatever Jesus did for the Jews, he also wanted to show, I came for the Gentiles. Because if you read the genealogies, you will find that Matthew starts off the genealogy by talking about the Jews. And it starts at Abraham, the promise of the Jewish nation. But you will find that uh, Luke is really a Gentile. Luke starts off in chapter 3. And instead of tracing the line, the lineage of Mary, he traces Joseph's lineage. But he doesn't go back to Abraham. He goes all the way back to Adam. Because that's the promise from the very beginning 
that God created man. So the promise is for not just the Jews, for all mankind. So here we have the feeding of the 5,000 found in verse 13. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place. The hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. And Jesus said to them, They don't need to go anywhere. You give them something to eat. <laughs> and I can see all of them looking like, you got any food? I don't have, what do you have? I got a cliff bar, I got a granola bar. What are you gonna give them? Verse 17, they scoured around. They came back to Jesus and says, we have found a little boy's lunch here that's got five loaves and two fish. We've heard this story since you were all little, but there's something I need to clarify for you. This is a little boy's lunch like maybe his lunch. Five loaves, when we think of loaves, we think of a loaf of bread. This little boy did not have five loaves like this for his lunch, okay? It was probably five little biscuits, little biscuits. Two fish were not like this fish for a little boy's lunch. It was two little fish, dried up probably. That was it. Five little loaves, smaller than probably my hand is about the size of two loaves. You're talking like half that and half. That's it. They bring that to Jesus. And, and you can probably think, and they're thinking, how in the world are you going to do this? Look at all those people. You got this little boy's lunch. How, how are you going to do that? They had to understand, and Jesus had to teach them. The what? Just go find it. How? Let me deal with that. And we're told, verse 20, or verse 19, he commanded the multitude to sit down. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up into heaven, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave it to the multitudes. So they all ate, and they were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. And now those who were eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So in actuality, you see the Jews never count the women. 5,000 men, guaranteed there's going to be 5,000 women. If there were three children on average for that family, that would be another 15,000. Probably 25,000 people there. 25,000, and Jesus fed them all. How? By his power. That's how. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. We always tell this story for children's story. We tell it in Sabbath school. Daniel in the lion's den. All the governors of the kingdom, in the kingdom, the, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, the advisors, they all counseled together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or any man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. They were setting a trap, a death trap, specifically just for one person, and that was Daniel. Oh, now, they said, now, O king, establish the decree, sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. He didn't put two and two together. And then Daniel, did Daniel care? No, he didn't care. He did the what? His what was he faithfully three times a day, he knelt with his open window and he was out there and he was praying to God. He did not care of the circumstances. He didn't care 
about the persecution. He just did what he always did. He didn't, he could have closed the blinds. He could have closed the windows. Daniel did the what faithfully. Persecution is coming this way. Keep doing the what. Let God deal with the how. Because the how comes up here. And they found out Daniel, and they said to Daniel in verse 13, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, he does not show you due regard, O king, for the decree you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard this, he was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. When these men approached the king and said to the king, Now, O king, that is the law of the Medes and the Persians, Persians that no decree or statute with the king, which the king establishes may be changed. Ah, uh, the king's thinking, you got me. He tried everything to get Daniel off the hook. But you know what? God is greater than King Darius. So the king gave the command. And they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Do you think Daniel was like, no, no, don't send me, don't draw me in? He went willingly. You know, the thing that, you ever heard of Veggie Tales? Veggie Tales is sacrilegious. Daniel gets dropped into the den of lions and he is praying in an attitude of prayer from the very beginning. But VeggieTales portrays it that he's having a pizza party with the lions. Come on, really? Daniel is revering God. The king knew that. The king says, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Daniel had such a thing about him that God knew. He's my man. They open, and Daniel's still there. Daniel, you're right. Yes. My God sent his angels to shut the lion's mouths. Go back a few chapters to Daniel chapter 3. And you'll find another story here. They're standing in front of this golden image. The image is 60 cubits tall. It's six cubits wide. It's six cubits deep. Interesting, all those sixes, right? And that image is standing there, gold, just like this. And if you've ever looked at the Oscar awards in Hollywood, it's the exact same image. There's a mockery of Stephen Colbert and another actor where they're talking to the Hollywood actors and they're saying, this is your God, O Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar had set everything up. He used every genre of music. He used every instrument of the day to induce people to bow down and worship the image. They're on the plain of Dura. I mean, when you have thousands of people out there, it's flat, it's pretty easy to see who's not bowing down. And you had the three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We have no account, no idea where Daniel was, what he was doing. But regardless, these other three friends could stand on their own. You know, it's said, it's, it's possible, if you go back to Daniel 1.8, Daniel said that he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's delicacies. He chose to eat a plant-based diet. You follow me on that? Is it an interesting that by eating a plant-based diet, it allows you to stand amidst the persecution of the day and not bow down. Hmm. 
something to think about. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down. And what we find that Nebuchadnezzar was told that there are three. Oh, he was furious. He tells them, stoke that fire. Get it seven times hotter. I don't know how you get a, hot, a fire seven times hotter. But I'll tell you, it was so hot that the men who bound the guards, the soldiers that bound up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that brought them and pushed them into that fire, they fell as dead men. And everybody's standing back and they're looking at these guys. Now, if these guys just fell dead, and after they pushed these guys in, the three Hebrews in, they're looking in the fire and Nebuchadnezzar says, didn't we push, didn't we put three in there? But there's four. And the fourth is like the Son of God. He orders them to come out, let them loose. The ropes were burned up. Their clothing, their hair was not singed at all. God protected them. Their duty was not to bow down to graven images. That was the what. How would they be able to stand that fire? When you get thrown into the fire, Jesus stands with you. You will never be able to survive it on your own, but only because of what Jesus can do can you make it through. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 7, Isaiah's unclean lips we're told here, when the perils encompass God's people and the powers of darkness seem about to prevail, God calls upon them to look upon his throne and direct and directing in the affairs of heaven and earth in order that they may take hope and courage. Isaiah says, I have unclean lips. God says, hey, that's no problem. Burns them with the hot coals of fire. You think Elijah, I mean, think, do you think Isaiah for a moment would have thought he would have, that God was going to do that? Because if he did, he has, oh, uh, uh, maybe, uh, that's okay. How about this one in Judges chapter 7? Judges chapter 7. Looking at verses 2 through 7. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many. There's too many guys here. He says, we need to slim this down. So, he says in verse 3, Now therefore, proclaiming in the hearing of the people, and say, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people, the men, returned. 10,000 remained. Can you imagine slimming down your army by one-third? You're down to one-third? You think Gideon's like, uh, one? Um, that's a lot of people, Lord, that went home. I mean, how, how in the world are we going to finish this fight? How are we going to win this fight? And then, can you imagine, poor Gideon? God says, uh, Gideon, the people are too many. What? You're kidding, right? No. Gideon didn't do that at all. God, God spoke to Gideon, and when he says, the people are still too many, bring them to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it shall be that whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. Of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue like a dog, they're not the ones. I remember a couple years ago, I was at that water area where Gideon took the 10,000 men. 
It's not a really big area. And I'm wondering, how did 10,000 gather, unless it was a greater pool of water at that time period. But while I'm there, I mean, the water was cool. It was very refreshing. And I'm thinking, 300. Only 300. From 32,000 down to 300. But notice what it says in verse 7. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Do you think for a moment that Gideon was questioning God by any chance? We're told here in Spirit of Prophecy, it says, by the simplest means, character is often tested. Those who in time of peril were intent upon supplying their own wants were not the men to be trusted in an emergency. The Lord has no place in his work for the indolent and the self-indulgent. The men of his choice were the few who would not permit their own wants to delay them in the discharge of duty. The 300 chosen men not only possessed courage and self-control, but they were men of faith. They had not defiled themselves with idolatry, God could direct them, and though and, and through them, he could work deliverance for Israel. Listen, success does not depend upon numbers. God can deliver by few as well as by many. I have to say, having pastored in this church, I'm a little dismayed with conference structure when we think success is by numbers. A growing church is by numbers. I'm sorry, I don't think that's the way God looks. He's looking at the heart of faith, not by how many baptisms or how much is being given or anything like that. He's looking at the heart because you could have a lot of tithe coming through, but you will have very little faith. We're in the weeding time period right now. The sifting, the shaking is going on right now. In early writings 270, Mrs. White asked, I asked the meaning of the shaking. It was, I had seen and was shown it would be caused by the straight testimony called for by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodicean. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and pour forth the straight testimony. Some will not bear the straight testimony, they will, they will rise up against it. And this is what causes the shaking among God's people. We are at that time now. In the what versus how, we have to wrap our minds around the fact that we are not God. We don't think like God, and we don't know what God is going to do, which is why he says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts, and my ways higher than your thoughts. Everything that you do, you have to ask in God's name, in his, according to his will. And he says, if you ask, it will be given to you according to that. I remember I was in South Africa, it was 2008, and I was preaching to the young people, but they had me preach somewhere to the adults, and the adults heard, and then they wanted to come to the youth meetings. So we had like 1,800 people in the youth meetings. It was in the gym of the Adventist camp there. And it was a beautiful day, 75 degrees, sunny, blue sky, not a cloud in the sky anywhere you can look. They took a break between Sabbath school and church and everybody started, you know, camp meeting. You haven't seen your friends in a long time. You start talking, talking, and talking. You totally forget about time. And I kept telling them, look, I'm going to share my testimony. Come back in. Nobody came back in. They were all outside. Now I'm thinking, Lord, this is not your will. How do we get these people in? So I went in the corner of the quiet room I was in and I knelt down and I just said out of the blue Lord I don't know how else to do this but you can send the rain 
I, I was just outside, blue sky, not a cloud in the sky. And I'm praying, Lord, send the rain. Get him in. And I remember we're going through the preliminaries of the church service, and then we get to special music. And then during the special music, as the soundtrack began, we heard this thunder on the ceiling. And I'm like, what is that noise? And I looked out the window, and it's pouring rain. What? Everybody's coming in, running in. When the DVDs were made of that sermon, I received an email from somebody. They said, Pastor, we're the only ones that could testify to this. We had no idea what we were seeing until we saw that DVD. You see, we were late coming to church because our daughter was sick. And around 1130, as we're coming closer, we saw the strangest sight. There was a little black cloud that just was racing across the horizon. And Sedaven is, is on a little bit of a hill, a mound. And they said, we saw this black cloud and it came and it sat right over Sedaven. And then it just disappeared. We didn't know what was that until we heard the sermon and we knew that was the cloud God had sent. If you ask in his name, it will be done for you. Desire of Ages 3.30 says, Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and the plain path before their feet. There were many different stories As I'm looking through all the different things, I, I see how God had been always with me. Even in my carnality, God is still there. I remember one time I, I had a man come up to me at a camp meeting <clears throat> and he said to me, what do you need in your ministry? I said, some means. He said, what would you do if you had money? I said, I'd go right to China to go preach. He says, okay. He walked away. Later on in the afternoon, he came to me and he handed me a, a folded check. And he said, go to China. And he dropped $10,000 in my hand. I had been praying for the opportunity and God opened that opportunity. You see, for us today, what I'm trying to say to you is this, the what versus the how. For us today, we're not really faithful in the what. And we always ask, how? You all came here in a car. That car, you put gas in. That gas is paid for probably with a credit card or a debit card, which comes from a bank, which you have money in. If I go to any one of your homes, there's guaranteed you're going to have food in your homes. There's going to be food in the fridge. There might be food in the pantry. But you've got some type of food, and you've got a home. You're not living in a tent somewhere. You're hungry, you don't have maybe what you want during the weekday, and you can run out and get some food. You can go to whatever food, fast food place you want and grab what you want. We're not living by faith. Because if we are really living by faith, do you think we should be giving away some of these things? And really, truly living on faith? I mean, there's an illustration where Mrs. White was talking here, and it's titled, An Impressive Dream. And I, I feel impressed that I need to share this with you. And it says here, um, this is kind of condensed a little bit, not in her words, but 
changed a little bit. Over 100 years ago, God gave Ellen White a dream. In the dream, she was traveling with a large group of people. Some of the people had their wagons loaded with all their things. The road they were traveling on was steep. On one side was a big drop-off, and on the other side, there was a high white wall. The road got narrower and narrower. So as they had to leave their wagons because there was not room enough for them. Some of the people tied their luggage on their horses and rode the horses, but the path kept getting narrow. So the people were all crowded near the wall. When their luggage hit it, they would sway towards the edge. They were afraid that they would fall off the edge. So they cut the luggage from their horses and let it fall off to the side. And when the road became so narrow that they were afraid that they would lose their balance, they got off their horses. Finally, they left their horses behind and they followed one another, walking each in other's footsteps. Then there were quite small ropes. They came down from the wall and they grabbed the rope to keep their balance. The rope moved as they moved. Finally, the path became so narrow that they had to take off their shoes and their socks. It even became too difficult to stay on the path because it became very dangerous. And many of the people were not used to such hard traveling. Notice those words. They were not used to that. Are you comfortable or are you used to it? Because the road had become so narrow, they could not walk. So they held on to the ropes tightly. And they said, we have to hold. We have to hold on from above. We have to hold on from above. Each person said these words to the next person in the path. Suddenly, the people on the path heard all kinds of noises from the cliff below. They heard naughty words. They heard bad music. They heard loud laughing. They also heard loud crying. The people holding the ropes on the walls were more determined than ever to keep going up the narrow path. But the ropes, they got bigger. They got stronger. In the dream, Ellen White saw that the white wall had blood on it. It made her sad to see the beautiful stained wall with blood. Then she realized that when people came up to the path and saw the stains, they would know that others had been there before them. And even though they had suffered a lot of pain, they kept going. This would give them courage to keep going on. Now the people came to a big cliff below them and the path ended. There, was, there wasn't anything to put their feet on. They had to trust the ropes, which they had become very thick. Some of the people wondered where the ropes came from and what was holding them. And in her dream, she looked across to the other side from the cliff and saw a beautiful field of green grass about six inches high. She could not see the sun, but the bright beams of light were like fine gold and silver resting in the field. It was more beautiful than anything that she had seen on earth. But would they reach the field? What if the ropes broke? Again, the people whispered, what holds the ropes? Then someone said, only, our only hope is to trust in Jesus. The ropes have held us safely all this way. They will still hold us. While they were waiting, they heard the words, God holds the ropes. We need not fear. Then Ellen White's husband, James White, swung himself over the cliff and landed in the beautiful field. Ellen then took the rope and swung across. Then the rest of the people did the same. They felt so relieved and happy that many sang a beautiful song to the Lord. Many times James and Ellen White had hard times, but they remembered the dream and they asked God to be with them in all that they did. We are told here, messages to young people 145, 
at the day of judgment, those who have been faithful in their everyday life, who have been quick to see their work and do it, not thinking of praise or profit, will hear the words, come you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Christ does not commend them for the eloquent orations they have made the intellectual powers that they have displayed, or the liberal donations they have made. It is for doing little things which are generally overlooked that they are rewarded. From Maranatha, page 74, experience is knowledge derived from experiment. Experimental religion is what is needed now. Some, yes, a large number, have a theoretical knowledge of religious truth, but have never felt the renewing power of divine grace upon their own lives, on their, upon their own hearts. They believe in the wrath of God, but they put forth no effort to escape it. They believe in heaven, but they make no sacrifice to obtain it. They know the remedy for sin, but they do not use it. They know the right, but they have no relish for it. All their knowledge will but increase their condemnation. They have never tasted and learned by experience that God is good. I want to close with a story. A man found a cocoon of a butterfly, and one day a small opening appeared in the cocoon. It took several hours for it to struggle to force its body through that little hole, and it seemed it was not making any more progress. It stopped. So the man, in his need to help the little butterfly, got a very small pair of scissors, and he started snipping where that hole was to make it easier for the butterfly to come out. And it, as soon as he did that, the butterfly kind of rolled out with a swollen body in small shriveled wings. The man continued to watch the butterfly because he expected at any moment it would, its wings would enlarge and it would take flight and be gone. But that never happened. In fact, the butterfly spent the rest of its life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings. It was never able to fly. What the man in his kindness and haste did not understand was that the restricting cocoon and the struggle required for the butterfly to get through that tiny opening were God's way of forcing the fluids from the butterfly's body into the butterfly's wings so that it would be ready for flight once it achieved the freedom from the cocoon. Sometimes struggles are exactly what we need in our lives. If God would allow us to go through our lives without any obstacles, without any struggles, it would cripple us, and we would not be as strong as we could have been, and we would never fly. I asked for strength, and God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked for wisdom, and God gave me problems to solve. I asked for prosperity, and He gave me brain and brawn to work. I asked for courage. And he gave me danger to overcome. I asked for love and he gave me troubled people to help. I asked for favors, he gave me opportunities. I received nothing I wanted. I received everything I needed. May God bless you. May his struggles that he puts upon you be for your own good in preparing you for what is about to come. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come to you, we count it a privilege to be able to come once again, to be able to hear your words. We ask and pray that you would take us in spite of ourselves, that you would reprove us, you would correct us, and that you would mold and fashion us after your will. There is a very large group of people around this world that do not know the name of Jesus. I ask that you would give us the opportunities, the abilities to be able to share and to witness and to study with people. Lord, help us to be mindful of the prompting of the Holy Spirit. 
Help us to listen very carefully. Help us to not be concerned with how, but be focused on the what with faith. Be with us. As we close off this last chapter in this world's history, we, may we be faithful in all that we do, in all that we say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.